All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Laura Winkle. I'm the Interpretation and Engagement Coordinator at Grazel Art Center. Um, and this is our third Thursday series for December. Um, this is a little different this time. Uh, third Thursdays is typically a monthly event and often it's in person in our galleries at Krasl. Um, or we've recently been doing some um, private Zoom live record or live meetings. Um, but today we're recording in advance. And the reason we're doing that is because the artists joining us are joining from, um, we're all in three different time zones today. Uh, so we have a special opportunity actually to pre-record this third Thursday um, and share it with all of you. So this is, like I said, it's something that happens every month. You can register for the January and February third Thursdays, um, but everybody gets to see the December third Thursday. I'm joined today um, by uh, Ravi Bhatia and Tim Beliveau, two artists that are featured in Krasl's current exhibition, Artists as Influencers, Pathways in Glass. This exhibition has been extended through January 24th so that everybody has an opportunity, hopefully, to see it in person. Um, and we're so excited to have these two artists here today and kind of have a dialogue between the two of them. Uh, Tim and Ravi are um, artists that have worked together in the past. They um, have collaborated. They have a really strong mentor-mentee relationship. And they were selected for this exhibition um, in part because of that because of the relationship they have with one another as artists. So we're gonna talk a little bit about their connections um, to the show, um, their professional collaboration, and what they're working on right now. So thank you both for joining us. Thank you, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, yeah. Uh, if you want, go ahead and just do, start with some brief introductions. Um, Ravi, yeah. you wanna so, start? Um, Hi, I'm Ragvi. I am joining you from New Delhi, India. Uh, I've been here for the last six months. Before this, I was in New York. And before that, I was pursuing my undergraduate degree in glass at the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, I met him for the first time at Pilchuck in 2017, um, when I was much younger. <laughs> um, but. I thought I could just share a few slides of how my work has progressed since then. Um, so in my practice, I'm interested in how contemporary art parallels organized religion. Um, and so I've been working on making a sort of religion of my own. The three deities of this religion are glass, skin, and water. So these are things that show up in my work a lot. Um, And I'm interested in how these three materials interact and inform each other. As part of this religion, I've created a sacred language. Um, I've been working on creating rituals, um, traditions, and mythologies. But most importantly, I've been focused on creating a new craft. I'm interested in the history of craft and religion and how religion fostered the development of um, a lot of the crafts that we see still existing today. So I'm just gonna take you on a bit of a historical tour. These are the first glass sea beads. They were, they were first made in India about 3000 years ago. Um, and they kind of look like that. So this was basically the first time glass was pulled into tubes and chopped up. Um, so this was 3000 years ago and about a thousand years ago, the Europeans figured out a way of making a lot of these really fast. And when they were sort of colonizing the rest of the world, they, these glass seed beads spread to Africa, Asia, and the Americas. Um, what I'm interested in is how seamlessly these beads were adopted by the communities where they kind of were forced into violently. Um, and so in my work, I use a lot of these seed beads, but I'm interested in um, using the glassness of the glass seed beads rather than the beadness of the, of the beads. Um, in the art historical canon, there's kind of a huge divide between form and material. So I'm interested in bringing the material 
of this form that's been so common across the world. This is the work that I have at the show up at Castle. These are two of the three pieces. Um, the three pieces are called Glass, Skin, and Water based on the three deities. Um, and this is just some of the recent work I've been working on. I was fortunate enough to get a residency at the Corning Museum of Glass a few months ago, right before everything shut down in the world. Um, and this is just a bit of my process where I tack down each of the beads individually um, with like Elmer's glue and then fuse them. So it's kind of these like really fragile, <laughs> Um, they're like two millimeters thick or like less than a sixteenth of an inch thick um, pieces. And yeah, that's my work. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Ragvi. Good to see that. Um, so I guess I, I could follow up. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That would be great. Um, okay. So. Can you all see okay? Yep. 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 Okay. I'll just go back here a step. Um, so I'm Tim Bellavo, uh, joining from uh, Bergen, Norway at the uh, S12 studio. Actually, that's, uh, I just finished work. So I'm, I'm still here uh, kind of sharing, sharing um, some images with you all. So um, I think I, I wanted to kind of start off on the point of um, influencing and um, mentorship um, with my, early studio practice um, when I came out of my undergraduate from the, uh, what was the Alberta College of Art and Design. It's now um, Alberta University of the Arts. Um, I met two peer glass artists, Philip Bender and uh, Ryan Fairweather, and we founded a studio, um, it was around 2004. And that became my home studio for 10 years. We just kind of launched out of undergrad and went full-time as glass artists, um, which was a little wild. Uh, as a thing to do, but uh, it was kind of out of necessity if you wanted to stay in the field, there were no jobs. So we learned a lot from our school. We learned a lot from each other, taught each other a lot of things and um, kind of kind of rolled influences together. Um, this is what an exhibition of ours would look like. Um, it was a lot of kind of character-based artwork, a lot of the things we watched and were interested in at the time, like in movies and things like that, but um, kind of a like loose uh, co collaboration and conversation and how to sculpt things. And um, we had a lot of different projects going on, but that was, you know, um, pretty glass oriented, um, you know, beginnings out of uh, my undergrad. Uh, one of the big influences in my practice is my sister happens to be a professional artist and uh, exhibiting quite a lot. Uh, this is her um, website uh, and just a sample of some of her works. She's got a few shows on this year, particularly. So um, we've always had a lot of conversations about art and art practice and um, things like that. So I'm pretty lucky to have uh, <laughs> a family member uh, who can, who's been able to teach me a lot as well. Um, when I got into my master's program at Concordia University in Montreal, um, I think I was taking the, the kind of 10 years of glass blowing as a full-time practice and just kind of deconstructing what it was and what it meant and found myself using a lot of digital tools and trying to figure out what role that had. Um, I always find with glass, it's such a kind of medieval process and you find yourself like on email, organizing how to produce something in the oldest possible way. And so that, that conflict of digital and, and handmade was interesting to me. And a lot of the research I started doing was based on that. Um, I 3D printed a metal mold um, to make replicas of this vessel that was really inspired by kind of um, Roman mold blowing, uh, glass blowing history. Um, a quick kind of reference of a piece. I found this um, plaster horse in the garbage. It's on the left in Montreal and I 3D scanned it and made a duplicate of itself to look back at itself. And a lot of this is, you know, the work kind of became about like duplicates and copying and reference to originals and what that meant. Um, and so I kind of, I went to the European Ceramics Work Center in the Southern Netherlands to do more research in terms of high temperature materials like clay and 3D print um, and technologies like that. And when I was kind of chewing with idea, like chewing on ideas about how that would look, I was borrowing a lot from like Roman history and kind of like um, artifacts and collapsed um, leftover artifacts and the way that digital technologies make artifacts. Um, and around that time, I started to kind of come together with some techniques that were sort of part of my research and things I wanted to share um, and things that I found people wanted to learn. And so I started teaching some of my digital to handmade process. And this is um, from 
Pilchuck in 2017, I taught a class called Glitchcraft, which is actually where I first met Rugby as a student. Um, so it was it was really fun uh, to have come up with a couple basic ideas and then watch how students handled it in such different ways. Um, and here's Rugby uh, working away on one of her projects, um, which was really exciting because the way she responded to the software and the glass and the class and the combination was so I thought I thought pretty nuanced and a pretty fast adopting of the process and how to mix these things. So it was it was really exciting to see this. Um, and then going forward, especially in the last couple of years, I've had a lot less access to studio or having the time to go to the glass studio. And my work kind of leaned off of material and went into more digital rendering and um, animating objects um, and kind of trying to like uh, make materials look as realistic as possible and finding out how software can and can't do that. So a lot of the work is about material, studying material, what its surfaces do. Um, and I teach that as well online. Uh, the last year has been a lot of online teaching and 3D software. Um, for people that are all locked at home and trying to make art in some way, <laughs> mostly. Um, and I still do some work where I will kind of start with the 3D rendering and develop a project that becomes handmade or physical. Um, so this is on the left and the right, that's that process. Um, originally for the Krasl, I was gonna bring some glass objects as well, um, which uh, the pandemic kind of blocked all of the travel and shipping that I could have done. So um, just a sense of where the glass has gone. Um, it's still, you know, I still make glass, but it's a lot of like material focused and surface and objects kinds of looking at it and how to look, make it look digital or have a conversation with digital objects. Um, and then a residency in um, Mexico at a place called Casa Lu. Um, really excellent residency um, that I would recommend. But uh, when I was there, I used a 3D scanner and was uh, copying surfaces and kind of rolling them into these landscapes and still lives that I could uh, print as 2D images and show. Um, so a lot of my work is, is kind of in this territory now. Um, and then the last few months, especially, uh, I've been doing a lot of like kind of tutorials in glass on 3D software and finding ways that the 3D software can help show glass process and its finer points and in special illustrations that like really help, I think, I, I hope help can understand the glass process a little bit. Um, so I've been able to share that with other glass people and people who don't know glass. And it's a really nice way to continue to work in the material, uh, especially when I wasn't able to, to actually uh, handle it. Um, so I think that's my introduction. Thanks for listening. Thank you both so much. Uh, that was more than I could have even hoped for. It, it's great to see and thank you both for sharing actually your work that is in the exhibition and for touching already on kind of you know how you met and how you've worked together in the past and and how those collaborations have affected your work. Um, so you know part of this exhibition um, is really dealing specifically with Studio Glass and kind of the history of the Studio Glass movement. Um, the difference between studio glass and factory glass, um, and then how artist relationships have really impacted the studio glass movement. And so, Tim, you've already kind of started talking about, you know, um, your collaborations and working with rugby. But can you just both talk a little bit more about how, you know, the and we've talked in the past about how essential it is to work together with glass you know, in the studio. And obviously both of you are not necessarily doing that as much as you have. Um, but can you share more how your mentor-mentee relationships have impacted your own work? And then, you know, how you think that that fits into the, the greater Studio Glass movement and the evolution of what it is today. Rabbi, Rabbi. I think you're... Yeah. <laughs> um, when I met him, I, um, one of the things that I was doing, the image that he showed was trying to create origami in the 3D software that he was teaching, as well as in the hot shop. Um, and this, I was like right in the middle of my undergrad degree then, and I, I couldn't have thought how much that simple process would influence me later on, but I think the, the main thing that I was struck by was um, Tim shared some of his research that he did at the European Ceramic Center. Is that, yeah. is that right? Um, where he basically was um, researching ceramic blow molds. Um, like at school, you, you're always taught like plaster silica blow molds or like plaster blow molds. And that was the first time I saw ceramic blow molds as well as a metal blow mold that Tim had 3D printed. Um, 
but the ceramic vermouths were like amazing because you could use them over and over and they maintained like this amazing level of detail which plaster silica vermouths never do um, and it kind of got me thinking about if something has been done in a material for, for like thousands or hundreds or even tens of years why is it done in that material and not another material um, and that kind of got me interested in material histories, um, I would say, which like greatly informed where I ended up now, <laughs> uh, working with the glass beads and just thinking about why those tiny beads are made of glass and not plastic, which a lot of people think they're actually made of plastic, but um, yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah, I can, I can jump in there too. I think, um... I think I, I owed a, a debt of gratitude to a few people who helped me with that process too. And I think what I was trying to do is roll together these influences I was getting. Um, I was I, I learned that the molds I was trying to get came like they were done in the Roman era and that there was this old technology that was so good and I hadn't been taught it. And I thought, why don't we have that? Like, that would be great. And also you see like 3D clay printers and uh, impressions being taken off of the clay and stuff. And I thought this just seems like it should combine. Um, and then eventually I found um, David Hill and Mark Taylor, who work in the south of England with the Glass Studio, and they're um, largely doing like art history reconstruction of processes, especially from the Roman era with glass. And they were kind enough to let me come over and work with them for a little bit and understand their process because they're very generous teachers. Um, and they basically showed me every single step that I was having trouble with. My first ceramic molds, I'd blow into it and it would just explode. And I just thought like, how is this supposed to work with the ceramic and the heat? Uh, and they knew all the mixes of the ceramics and how to treat them and how to dry them. And so um, I got a lot of really generous help from them and the European Ceramics Work Center um, to kind of like figure out all the gaps and then put these parts together into something that became what was the Glitchcraft course. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I think another thing, like the course was called Glitchcraft. And um, I think something that was kind of already a big part of my education that was kind of like super set in stone in my head at uh, Pilchuck was just embracing the glitches that are like um, not replicable, but also like kind of so specific to the material um, and just embracing them and going with them instead of trying to work against them. Um, yeah. That's something that, especially with the like glass seed bead work that I'm doing now is essential to me because <laughs> I'm I've been working with found glass and there's so much stuff that just doesn't go as smoothly as if I was working with like bullseye or something. Um, but it's that's the point. It's working with the glitches. <laughs> and Rugby, did you get any specific help in the history of those beads or an understanding that particularly or did you research it all kind of independently? I researched um, I researched it all when I was doing my undergrad at RISD and then I got, I researched it all and then I kind of drew a bunch of conclusions um, <laughs> which are fully research supported. Uh, but I got a bunch of help from the curator of ancient glass at Corning um, who knew so much and sent me links to so many articles which doesn't disprove the theories <laughs> that I came up with. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so it, I got a bunch of help, um, just kind of with more in-depth, uh, research into glass seed beads, but I, um, I, I was actually traveling to the place where the first glass seed beads were made there in Southern India. And I happened to go to the bead museum and I happened to like see the first glass, first these like weird looking beads. Um, and then, yeah, that's just kind of where this whole, this whole journey began. Yeah, I, I think, think it, no, oh, oh, go ahead, Tim. Um, I was gonna, I was gonna kind of speak to, you mentioned before about glitches and, and kind of things not being entirely the way you intended. Um, and I think like I'm more recently discovering like the value of getting it wrong and why that's really helpful. Uh, and the glitchcraft idea was like, I just found like 3D, 3D software is so frustrating and it can backfire and fail so badly that if you don't love the process, you're going to hate the whole thing. Like it takes a lot of patience. Um, yeah. The same was true with me learning the ceramics and the combination of all these things. And um, I think for a second, I thought I was trying to get 
like perfect understanding of how these materials work together. And then if I ever got it right, it was super boring. And so um, I think I've, I've learned to kind of like the glitch crafting is about just like the process being kind of more interesting for me now, especially. And also making things work with what you have. And like in terms of research, if you have access to the thing, that's great. If nobody can tell you what the history is and you get it wrong, it's usually something interesting can come out of that. Um, <laughs> yeah, like I, I, I made up this whole story in my head that the first beads were the first beads were made in southern India, but I made up this whole story that they like went to Europe and it was like this whole route that I'd planned out in my mind, which again still hasn't been disproven. <laughs> and some of the beads from southern India were found in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, so it like makes sense, but it's kind of taking that leap of faith. Um, and even like working with the glitches that exist in research, because this stuff happened thousands of years ago and there's, unless the researcher is really interested, I think it's like, as an artist, you have the flexibility of kind of creating your own narratives, which I, I do a lot of, but um, <laughs> it, it's this weird like fictional for, or virtual versus real thing. Yeah, that's, I, I'm glad you, talked about that because I was curious you know a lot of what you were talking about in your you know working with other artists uh, was sounds fairly technical right you're learning skills and that's a huge that has impacted your work but I'm curious too how it has in, impacted kind of your concepts of your work right um, and it sounds a little bit like you know the parallel between research which again feels kind of technical or scientific in a in a way um, but then the the leaps of faith or the you know the getting to make your own narrative that is somewhat conceptual that seems like it's a part of um, you know your artist statement I guess I would say so will you share just a little bit um, more both of you you know what is your work about you know what what have you been thinking about um, Ragvi you talked a little bit about you know the connection to organized religion um, but are there other things you've been exploring, you know, conceptually? Uh, with your I, um, I've been using the creation of a religion kind of as a framework for my practice, which is why there's a lot of room to like create fictional stuff or virtual stuff or just stuff that like narratives or mythologies that don't exist yet. Um, so I have been working on creating like this language the whole religion is rooted in material practices. So the language that I'm working on is actually um, based off of a Moroccan craft. I was in Morocco for a month or so, and I was exposed to this like craft where they take like fired ceramic tiles and chip them to make these geometrically precise shapes. And when I was there, I found out each shape has a name um, and they're like super poetic. Um, I can. Yeah, I think I your try. website shows it really, really well. Uh, but yes, yeah, so I've been working on translating those names and I've had a fair amount of help from the Moroccan government. Um, and we've got a little, I've got a little bit of a lag. So we might ask you to just repeat your last sentence or two. Yeah, sorry. Um, it's, I've been using the names of the tiles. So I think it's my connection. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Um, it's back now for me, at least. It's, it's clear again. Mm -hmm. I've been using the names of the tiles as a framework to create a language that I use to translate the tile patterns into poems. And then in turn, using that language to translate patterns that we find in the world all around us. Um, so that's one thing. And then even the deities, they're like skin, water, both materials that are all around us and then glass, which for me, I think is the closest material manifestation of light, um, which again is all around us. So yeah, just kind of making up these virtual narratives um, that are rooted in like material history that's thousands of years old. Thank you. Fascinating. Yeah. 
I think um, I think when you mention this about especially the tiles and the poetry, for me, when you describe like religion and ritual and process, like that one really ties it together. It's a very it's very, I think, understandable. It's a nice way to, to kind of put all your ideas or some of the ideas in, in one piece. Thank you. I can share some images of the craft. Um, I think that'd be great. You know, something that I think is, at least in this exhibition, um, really was surprising and exciting for me was that a lot of, I was expecting just glass. Um, and a lot of many of the artists in the Artists as Influencers exhibition are obviously working with other media um, and, and other materials. Um, and so it's really neat to see um, how you incorporate them. And I'm curious, you know, what came first for you? Were you, I mean, you both shared a little bit of your story or your path to glass. Um, and obviously, Tim, it seems like your sister maybe also impacted some of the other um, mediums that you use, but how do they, how do they connect? Do you have a favorite? Um, <laughs> do you only see them as they relate to one another? Um, is it all about just whatever medium you need to get that idea across? Or do you get excited about the material and then come up with the, the work of art? You know, mm. curious what came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> Um, maybe I could I could maybe speak to that a little bit. Um, I have this like uh, difficult relationship with glass process. I think because I did it for so long, I've, I've been doing it for so long, um, and there's so much pattern and technique to it that it's really easy to get totally sidetracked by like the proper way to do a thing. And so after you know how to make objects a certain way, to not do it the the proper way is hard. It's really hard to like stop your hands from doing the like finishing whatever process. Um, and so. I think my relationship to other materials is like, I want to see the, like, I, it's hard for me to make the glass fail in some ways to see those glitches, those accidents. Um, but if I jump into a new me medium, I don't understand it happens all the time. And that's great. Um, and so I kind of got excited to, especially with clay and ceramics and other like materials like that at the EKWC, the European Ceramics Work Center. Um, because I was getting all these great results and I just couldn't predict what was gonna happen. And then going back to glass, I could try to like forget what I know a little bit and get more of these results. So a lot of the work that I would do, it really starts with like material. And then if I set a goal that's impossible, I'll usually fail at it. And that's a really nice way to generate what becomes an artwork. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, like at Bill Jack where Jim and I first met, um, if anyone hasn't been to Peltrack, there's usually a bunch of simultaneous classes with um, a bunch of le levels. So there's beginner, intermediate, advanced. Um, it was amazing because Tim's class had all levels, um, but it's kind of wild how some of, how advanced some of the advanced people are. <laughs> like they really have, like Tim said, they like know what they're doing and they want to make a thing and they're great at it. They're like way better than I can ever dream of being at their, um, their respective skills. But um, I think one of the things when we were in Tim's class was he, he'd made this like roller stamp out of ceramic and you, we kind of like had this challenge amongst each other where we had to like roll the stamp all the way across this glass object and the person who did it like won. <laughs> Um, I think the award was a free coffee or like a free latte from the uh, the store. Yep, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> uh, And I think someone did manage to do it, but yeah. in the process, it was it was just amazing to see all these people. Some some of the people who just learned how to work with glass. Some of the people who were like like there was one student who was doing her PhD in glass, um, and everyone was kind of excited to like run the stamp across this glass object. So I think the playfulness of um, like that kind of, again, made me realize that you can be really good at something, but continue like playing with it. And just there's like, if you, if you step away from something and come back to it, especially from someone else's perspective, there's always something new or like more to learn. Um, yeah. and also like Tim said, there's, um, I, I'd, I'd been thinking through like the, kind of motto of my school is like thinking through glass, like thinking through the material. Uh, but I was also really interested in writing and 
um, all this other stuff. And I think when I was taking that class, I realized that the virtual is also material, like something as simple as we all had to have laptops, but we all also had to have like a mouse. Like it's really hard to do 3D rendering on the laptop keypad, but you have to have a mouse. And that's like such a material thing where you think <laughs> that it's like all virtual, but you have to have this little thing that um, allows you to make your work. I've never thought of a mouse like a like a paintbrush or a pencil before, but I guess that kind of really is what it is in that situation. Well, I think maybe. And I, oh, go ahead, Tim. Well, I was going to say, uh, kind of uh, adding to your your last bit, um, Ragvi. I, I think it's um, and, and partly this this idea of exploring and being kind of looser with the material. Um, we've both been to Oxbow um, School of Art and Artist Residency, um, which is near the Krasl. Uh, and um, I think, uh, the, you know, one of the other, you know, debts of gratitude I owe is to Jerry Catania, who's also, uh, maybe we could talk about this more. Um, it was, you know, he's inspired this whole show. Yeah. And um, I didn't get to meet him right away. I had uh, probably, I think, a full summer working at the Oxbow Glass Studio before I met him. But I walked into this place that he built, and it was all of his ingenious kind of like handmade solutions and a lot of rusty metal. And you just look at it, you look at a tool for a while, you're like, what is that for? And then just kind of like reverse engineer it and you're like after you get it it's just like that's brilliant that, i've never seen that in the glass studio but he like figured this unique there'd be a, kind of nowhere else to blow glass like that um and what was nice about it is that without even having met him he kind of like got me to rethink how i do things just from being in that studio um, and this is that kind of freedom and looseness to just kind of like rethink what you know and don't be too precious about technique and uh, i think it made it you know that lasting impact in the studio which i i think is still there that's just uh that approach to just like reinvent it, make it your own thing, you know. Yeah, and I think that's that's kind of how like that's how Studio Glass developed, right? There were a couple of people who like went over to Italy and they like brought this stuff back that they knew and they kind of they taught people who taught people who taught people. And I think Tim and I both were exposed to glass in our undergraduate universities. Um, but if that's not your situation, it kind of requires a huge amount of like financial commitment and like time commitment to get into glass and be able to work with glass at a point where you're like actually good. Um, so I think that kind of uh, passing down of what you know is essential to studio glass surviving um, today. Because if like everyone had to have their own hot shop set up before they could like be blowing glass, it would be impossible. That and the fact that there are so many craft schools across the um, United States, Piltrack is one of them, Oxbow is one of them, um, where this legacy of the previous generation, not even the previous generation, like literally the summer before kind of lingers <laughs> on <laughs> uh, year after year. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's that's so interesting to me. I think that um, something I hadn't thought about is the the curiosity that seems essential to the studio glass movement. Like, how do I make this work for myself, or how do I, you know, use a new technique, or you know, that just seems like every single one of the artists that we've had the opportunity to talk to shares something that seems totally unique to your work, um, and it feels almost very young and fresh as a medium, even though it's been around for so long, which is exciting for me because I didn't know anything about this. And um, <laughs> I love that. Um, so you both talked a little bit about, you know, how you got started with glass. And I do want to spend a little bit of time, if you would, just sharing some advice for people who, you know, aren't connected to glass, who might be interested in um, getting started and, you know, we've all mentioned that it's it's one of those things where uh, not everybody has access to it. So what are some ways that people can get started with glass or what are some resources out there for people who are just interested in glass in general? Um, I could I could maybe offer a few things. Um, I think from what I understand, like over over time, like a, the, you know, American studio glass movement kind of has its roots in the 70s, roughly the early 70s. Um, I think that the sense I get is the way you would start in glass then is pretty different to now. We've had a lot of time to develop and a lot of large institutions have grown up. So I think 
back then it would have been hard to have anybody teach you a class, you know, that was just starting. Now there's tons of institutions offering lots and lots of classes. And um, I think instead of a lot of like independent production artists, you have a lot more organized studio groups offering coordinated services and classes as larger, larger organizations. So I think the way that we approach it now is pretty different. I think in most of the large cities and at least in North America, a lot of them will have a glass, well, not a lot of them, but there, there are glass studios around. At least in your region, hopefully. Yeah. In your region. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so usually you can take like short classes. Uh, we were both in New York before this, uh, Rugby and I, and so uh, Urban Glass there does quite a lot of program, a lot of outreach. Um, even at this time with the studio closed, they have a lot of online courses and online offerings that they're that they're um, putting out there in the community um, to try to cope. And so I think um, for younger artists trying to get involved, I would look for those studios. Um, some of them even have like uh, early positions in assisting or um, sometimes you can volunteer with those organizations and get kind of an early understanding, meet people and get to know them. Um, and then definitely apply for scholarships. All of the uh, craft schools that Ragdi was talking about and, and many more of them, um, they will have um, teaching assistance opportunities and scholarship opportunities. Um, and I think if you apply to a bunch, your odds are good. Um, I would hope so. We're always trying to fundraise for these things to happen. Um, so I think within the glass community, I think we're seeing a lot of people who recognize what a benefit it's been to them and are trying to create more opportunities for the next generation. And I think there's more scholarships and classes around you know, now than even 10 years ago. I think that's a fair, fair assumption. So, um, yeah. Also, I think um, people have gotten a lot more generous um, than say even in the 70s, even though there was that whole mentor mentor relationship, but for someone like Tim to spend all this time researching um, this technique of making ceramic bow molds and like going through a bunch of iterations and glitches and then being willing to share it with a bunch of people he just met. <laughs> um, I think that's something that's um, a lot more common, like just people being willing to share what they know. Um, a lot of the times it's even online, like Bolza has a great forum. If you wanna get into fusing, um, which is like the easiest thing if you just wanna dip your toe into, <laughs> into glass, but there's a lot of online resources and if you like, once you make a connection, I think, with someone who's, like, if you go to any craft school or any of these glass centers, I think people are really willing to stay in touch with you and help you out if um, if you want to continue working with it. Yeah, that's that, really helpful. Um, also, sorry, the, the Glass Art Society um, is, you know, our, our major organizing group uh, worldwide for hosting annual events and uh, collecting our community together or whoever can join. Um, and they not only have their conference once a year, but they also have post all the opportunity, well, a lot of the opportunities and residencies and things like that and people working in the field. So you could kind of start there as a hub to find your way to something local or something that you, uh, you might want to uh, apply for. Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, in my mind, I wasn't thinking of any virtual resources connected to glass because it feels very hands-on yeah. um, but even you know obviously Tim you know you have some incredible you know even just visiting Tim and Robbie's websites like I think if anybody is interested you should take a closer look um, because it is just more than you know it is more than what you expect I think um, glass I had so many preconceptions of what glass is and it's so much more than that uh, so thank you I want to kind of wrap up today um, just talking about where you are now. You know, we've been talking a lot about how uh, collaboration is essential, staying connected to your glass communities really seems essential to your work. Um, but obviously, we're in some ways more connected and in some ways less connected than we've been um, in the past. So, you know, what are you working on right now? Who is your glass community right now? Um, what kinds of projects, you know, if any, do you want to share with us? Um, and how have you how have you found ways to stay connected with your glass community? Or are you, you know, focusing on more personal solitary projects? Yeah, Rugby, do you wanna do you wanna oh, chip sure. in? Um, so yeah, I moved back to Delhi um, in the summer, in the middle of the pandemic. Before that, I'd been in New York. Before that, I was in a glass program. <laughs> Both of those places are very highly saturated with glass artists. Um, New Delhi is not. India has um, a very, very almost non-existent <laughs> um, 
glass scene. So I would say my glass communities remained what it was um, with the people I knew um, where I think, so the work I'm currently doing is continuing the work with the seed beads. I set up a studio of my own. I have my own kiln. So I'm continuing uh, working on my fusings, but I think it's, I'm not a solitary worker. So I kind of need to have conversations with my community all the time because we kind of feed each other. Um, just like even this short conversation we've had, I think um, has fueled so much of the stuff and even made so much of the stuff I was thinking of um, clearer to me. So I, I don't have this community in the same sense as um, I used to, where I was like physically working in the shops uh, with fellow blast artists, but I think, yeah, the virtual has been, been strange, but I think it's been um, fruitful still. What about yeah. you, Tim? Yeah, I would say um, also, and Raghvia and I haven't had a chance to catch up in a while. So yeah, we're actually, this is the experience right now of having <laughs> a community and it's really nice. Um, but uh, I think also, yeah, I've been online quite a lot. And then um, I, I guess it was a little more than a year ago, I started suggesting out there that I knew how to do some things in 3D software and I'd be willing to share and teach. And people have been taking me up on it more and more. Um, I was working all through the summer for a student independently um, learning 3D software and I just kind of like take on more of that. So I, I'm finishing a class with Urban Glass right now for online um, 3D rendering glass. And we have kind of a, a sort of community there, um, which is really nice. Um, and then I was in Canada before um, at the start of this year, before I came over here to S12 to work with the team. Um, so I kind of moved to a community where there's a studio that I can access. And I think in Canada, especially because the distances are so big, we're mostly pretty used to going very, very far to access something like glass. Um, like three day drives are not uncommon. Uh, so wow. the idea of packing up and going to another country is like, well, yeah, we've been doing that for a while. So <laughs> whatever it takes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, if it's a viable thing, I usually have just, you know, tried, tried it out and done a lot of like, you know, big changes to try to get access and meet new people and be part of communities if I can. So um, yeah, I try to kind of do both is just maintain what I can virtually offer what I can. And, um, and then um, I was lucky enough to be able to come over here uh, after what, six months of delay. Um, and I have to give a shout out to Emma Baker, who was intending to be here for about two weeks and ended up here for six months as the <laughs> studio manager while we couldn't get my flights uh, to work. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I'm excited for a time when we can all uh, get back to studios together again. It'll be really nice. <laughs> it sounds like you're both making the most of it. It is incredibly impressive how persistent you are to, you know, do what you need to do to continue making your art. Um, but yeah, we're all obviously ready to, to be back in more <laughs> collaborative spaces. Well, I want to thank you both um, for joining us today. We are getting close to the end of our time. Is there anything else that you just, you know, you want to share or any questions you have for one another since this is a, an opportunity to, to chat with one another um, before we wrap up? Well, I was kind of wondering if um, it might be nice to share in here too. If, if you've, have you been able to gather any responses on the show or any um, responses from people about what they've seen Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, for us, the show, and I, this is a great time for me to just say, you know, obviously, a special thanks is due to Jerry Catania for curating the exhibition. Um, it is uh, a special chance for us to have artists from all over the world, you know, and such a variety of um, glass art. In, this, in the galleries. And I think, you know, that has been obvious to people when they come in, you know, everybody comes in and says kind of like, oh, this is not what I was expecting. Maybe I didn't know what to expect. Um, so that has been wonderful for us to, to have people in the galleries and sharing that with us. Obviously, it's also just very special for people to see um, Jerry's work. You know, we do have some um, artworks by Jerry in the exhibition and a lot of people, you know, come just to do that, just to see that. And then there, you know, the um, the span of work again, from Jerry to all of these new artists um, for our, you know, new for our community. So that's been wonderful for us and people are, are really enjoying that and, and commenting um, on those things, especially. 
and I hope that we continue. I mean, you know, I hope we continue to have more people in the galleries to to see it now that we've extended the exhibition as well. Yeah. And uh, people get to interact with glass, I think, um, which is pretty cool too. Like we have some artworks that really are um, kind of more installation based and, you know, people can, we have some breathing glass um, by Brianna Barron. And yeah. I think no one comes into the galleries expecting to uh, to see glass move or, you know, um, to see, to understand, to see like the scale of rugby as compared to the scale of some of the other pieces in the show. So that's been a delight. Like I think people are having fun with it in a way that they weren't expecting to have fun. That's great, yeah. Well, it's a real pleasure to be to be part of it. Um, and, uh, and yeah, really appreciate it. Thank yeah, you both. And, yeah, and thanks to Tim for um, introducing me to the castle and all of you. Uh, wonderful people there. <laughs> we really appreciate both of your your um, artworks. Thank you for your involvement in the exhibition. Thank you for joining us today. Um, everybody who's watching, you can see uh, the work of Tim Belvo and Raghvi Bhatia in Krasl's galleries by appointment. So we encourage you to make an appointment and come in and see the show. It's up through January 24th. Um, also, like I said earlier, please do visit their websites and, and see more. Um, you can see some, you know, we have a really cool uh, 3D video by Tim in the galleries, but also you can see um, that glass work, some of the glass work that um, we did not have an opportunity to exhibit. Um, and then also, obviously, a lot of the work that Rogby was talking about specifically, I think you should look at the, the poetry, the I don't know, ceramic poetry, <laughs> I don't know what you're calling it, but um, the examples that she shared, it's wonderful to get to look at that um, on your own time too. Um, as I mentioned before, this is a monthly series. So please take a look at crassel.org. You're welcome to sign up for the January and February sessions. Um, and we hope you guys have a great evening, which is what time it will be when everybody watches. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again both for joining. I really appreciate it. Good to see you guys. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having us virtually. <laughs>